All right, KISS Army, welcome to the KISS FAQ podcast. Thank you for letting us into your head. I hope we don't do any damage. This is a KISS-related podcast by the board for the board. We hope you enjoy. Welcome to episode 29 of the KISS FAQ podcast. I'm your host, Julian Gill. Joining me today is Alex, bag boy on the FAQ, Lonnie, who has not been demoted or fired, uh, <laughs> If you watch episode 28, you might think so. Not not his fault. It was uh, technical issues on my side. And Mark, (laughs) welcome back, Marcus Almighty. Greetings. So, yeah, thank you everyone for your patience with the last episode. Uh, There were a few cut and paste marks in that uh, video and audio, probably less noticeable on the audio. There were some very interesting frozen faces at times on the video. Uh, But what the heck, it's entertainment and it's free. Um... Technical issues, it's going to happen, and hopefully not today. So I'm back and hosting today, and it's uh, just to, to rotate around. Not that Lonnie did anything naughty, because I was the one who was recording, not him. <laughs> I'm also the one who forgot that we were taping a show today, so uh, I will just say, cheers. Uh, <laughs> and he's drinking all right. <laughs> yeah, get, getting straight into that. Um, the topic today, gentlemen, is... 2015 is the 20th anniversary, and I guess in Kissland we love our anniversaries. It's the 17 and a half anniversary of something stupid in Kissland, no doubt. Um, but it's the 20th anniversary of the Kiss Convention Tour, which of course took place, th- um, what was it, February 1995 through the MTV Unplugged taping and filming in August of that year, and then their final performance of 1995 was an acoustic uh, mini set for, I think it was Mark and Brian's KLOS um, Christmas special, so they they went in at 8 a.m. in the morning that day and played three songs and got out. Um, So, unplugged, essentially. We don't need to, to jump in and talk at all about the electric sets that the band did in Japan and Australia, though, just to say... Those are some of the most incredible pre-reunion KISS sets and performances. Uh, go on to YouTube. There are, I think it's KISS Alive 3.5 mm-hmm. is one. <laughs> Nagoya, the video is absolutely, it's it's a audience shot video, but the, the I think it's nearly a soundboard, which probably means it's just Japanese audience, um, is incredible. Utterly incredible. And... Did they use the Animal Life stage for the U.S. tour? No, they took Leon. Oh, okay, they hit Leon for that one. Or, or was it Michael Spinks? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Won't go there again. Um, so they took Leon out to uh, Japan and Australia. Um, but in Australia, they were doing an acoustic show and then an electric show, acoustic, electric. And Australians got the first acoustic-only set. So they were really the guinea pigs for the whole... Um, Un- unplugged era. Um, they had originally planned to do a show in in Japan. They got cancelled uh, for one reason or another. So let's jump in with the the acoustic era. I, I mean, I don't even know where to begin with this. Uh, you know, maybe some of the outstanding tracks from the era that really you think worked well. Um, Alex, what are your thoughts on the unmasked era? I mean, um, the unplugged era. <laughs> I've got to hear I'm some doomed. of these shows. <laughs> I got to hear some of these shows before. Um, again, like you know, Julie mentioned, you know, if you haven't seen these, YouTube it's the place to be. All of this stuff exists on there. Um, and I think uh, what a cool set list. I mean, you got to hear something that didn't normally play often. Going blind, hold like woman, um, forever uh, acoustically. You know, of course, has a better sound. Um, and then he had, and he had a world without heroes. You know, something from the elder going on for you there. Um, at the same time, you had some stuff. They tried to do the, uh, they had the partials where they kind of get through with songs all the way through, like Magic Touch or uh, Just a Boy or um, Flaming Youth, Mr. Speed, kind of a deal. But you know, at the same time, you got the, you got this intimate setting. You're with the band. Um, it's almost kind of like you're sitting around. I like to imagine. Um, yeah, up here being at college, we go to the dunes on the weekend quite often, and we'll have a big fire, and somebody ends up pulling out the guitar, and then you're all sitting around the fire and jamming and stuff. And so I feel like you kind of got that setting in a way. You know, you kind of get in the hang with kids for a little bit. 
they'll play a few songs they knew all the way through. They'd, uh, they'd toy around with something they didn't know so well. Even ones that want to make sense to play um, acoustically, uh, like Shout It Out Loud or Unholy. One can only imagine um, the, the difficulty it could have been trying to get the same sound. But other than that, pretty cool sell list. Mark, what's your take on the Unplugged Era? Um, I actually liked it. Um, I thought that the uh, songs that they chose for the actual uh, recording that they did for the MTV proper was uh, obviously the best of the material that they kind of worked out throughout their tour. Um, because just like uh, Alex mentioned, there are definitely a few songs in that list of songs that he did over the tour that are, were definitely probably head scratchers for some people. I mean, like you said, I can only imagine how unholy or take me or something like that would have sounded acoustically or even like making love. I mean, that's a total, you know, full out electric song and to play that kind of acoustically seems kind of odd. But, uh, I think that the, uh, it was smart though that he took a chance and played a lot of different material. And it was also kind of cool that they, you know, took audience requests, even though they probably didn't play more than 20 seconds of some of these songs, but you know what the hey? I mean, they were there for the fans. That was, that was Gene's big point, wasn't it? We're here for the fans, right? So if somebody yelled out an odd song and they wanted to, they gave it a shot at least, right? So I think it was a, I think it was a very good idea. I think it reconnected them with a lot of their audience, and I think it, uh, it helped more than it hurt them in the long run. Yeah, they were certainly very willing to try just about anything, whether it was one note uh, or twenty. You know, they really. They went for it, but I, I think the one of the funnest comments um, that Paul made during that tour was every time he made he they tried Mr. Speed, and I don't think they ever got through it completely without someone else singing. Was we have got to learn this song is what he said for Mr. Speed, and oh my God, if that song didn't work really well acoustically, Lonnie, what's your take on the Unplugged Era, and not just what I just said? No, oh, you look at you look at some of those set lists, especially, um, and not only the set list, but listen to those shows. There's bootlegs of them all over the place. We all have a bunch of them, but you listen to those Australia bootlegs um, and how the band sounded on those, and what they thought the audience wanted to hear, and then the audience is calling out songs that they never hadn't played in maybe ever, and they're trying to muddle their way through them and. You can tell the difference then when they do the sets in the U.S. in the summer of 95 that they were a lot more rehearsed um, for what the audience was looking for. I think they went down to Australia and kind of got a feel almost for what what the fans were looking for. And by the time the, the extras in the U.S. started, they had, they had worked out sure enough something and it really sounded really good. And... and um, and other songs like that, like going, like going, going blind was a staple from the from the beginning. Though actually, like, you look at the Australia one, like the second song, on February seventh was going blind. It was one of them that um, that they had kind of thought through, I think. But um, they, um, they 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 really progressed and they really did connect with the fans. That's one time. Kiss always says that they're a band that that is all about the fans for the fans. Well, this was really, you know, you, you can you can argue that all you want to right now, but. Back in 95, they really were a band for the fans and giving the fans, the hardcore fans, what they wanted. I think that was the tour that they really tried to connect. Maybe the last tour, they really tried to connect with the hardcore fans. Um, and that's and that's why I think 20 years later, um, people like, like us and people in the FAQ are still talking about the Unplugged era because it was so unique that not only did you get to see the band play an Unplugged set full of gems that you would never, ever expect to hear. But also, you know, the band was there to sign autographs, the band was there to answer your questions, the band was there showing off their memorabilia from, from the 70s. It was really a well-thought-out plan of, of going after the hardcore fans that were still there. And in 1995, that's who was left, especially the summer of 95, before MTV Unplugged, that's who was left for just more the hardcore fans that would fill these hotel ballrooms. So it was really a well thought out move by on and Gene no, Gene takes credit for it, but Gene takes credit for a lot of things. But it was a really thought out move on Gene and the band's part. 
But it comes at a time that it's really an adhere of the band's career. I mean, mm -hmm. Revenge Tanks, the tour absolutely sucks eggs in terms of attendance. Um, and whether or not they say they ended it early, they, they did all the scheduled dates. They just didn't schedule any more in December 92. 93, they did two appearances. Uh, I mean, 93, pardon me. 94, they did the Monsters of Rock and some fairs in the U.S. So they mm -hmm. really had nowhere else to go. Uh, it's, it's an incredible idea that they actually, I mean, number one, they went to a great deal of effort raiding the Detroit Expo to get their costumes back so that they could... Uh, it's a great video. <laughs> they, yeah, so they could, uh, they could have something to display. And this is something that they can never do again now. They can't do a convention tour with a, a touring museum because they sold everything at Butterfields. Um, you know, so they might have to go to some of these Uber collector fans and say, hey, can we borrow some of your shit for, you know, six, six months if they were ever to do another convention tour. But getting back to what you were saying about Australia, yeah, they were the guinea pigs. And you look at Perth, first, the first show, February the 3rd, it's almost like an electric show. Strutter, you know, mm -hmm. Domino, Do You Love Me, I Still Love You, Black Diamond. You know, it's very safe. Heaven's on Fire. So they haven't really... I don't know how much thought they gave it. They've got a few songs in there, you know, Magic Touch, We'll Try, um, Lick It Up. Sure, something's a partial on there. Like they, they weren't, they weren't planning on things like that. Like yeah, that. It, it, it's like they really didn't know what was going to number one resonate with the fans, and, and maybe actually that's number two. And number one is what actually works uh, acoustically. So that first night they do, I think, twenty songs. The next acoustic show in Adelaide, they do twenty-three. The next one in Melbourne, up to 32 attempts, you know, that songs and partial attempts. And then they're throwing in stuff like Just a Boy, you know, I guess Gene remembers two notes of that. So, you know, you, you play that and the Kiss fans. Hey, you know, what, what's listening to these shows, I mean, the first thing you really notice is you play a note and Kiss fans start singing. It's like a Pavlovian response. Oh, I know that. You know, and just everyone start. It's like a kumbaya session for uh, in the Church of Christianity. So it's, it's really fun in that way. But, you know, when they get to Brisbane and Sydney, you know, they're, they're starting to get a better idea of what works. And then you've got, what, four months off before Los Angeles or Burbank, wherever it was for the U.S. one. And I totally agree with you that, you know, they had really figured it out a lot more and rehearsed because what do we get? In, what, what do we get in the U.S.? Coming home. Plaster caster. And, and Mark, forgive me, I said the U.S. What do we get in North America? <laughs> Canada as well, because obviously they did Toronto and, uh, yeah. and Montreal. So let's talk about some of these songs. And I'm going to go straight back to Lonnie. What are what, some of the songs that really jump out of you as the ones on the convention that work acoustically? And that's even with Gene using his electric bass. You know, I, mean, and I mentioned Sure Know Something right off the bat from when I started talking about Setless. Sure Know Something, for me, um, just incredible the way that sounds acoustically um not only on some of the bootlegs but then also by the time they get to mtv even though if you listen to the mtv version paul does sing the wrong verse on it um it is really good it's it's just perfect um got to choose got to choose works incredibly on flood um the track from mtv that's on the box set is probably my favorite version of got to choose um Another one that they that they didn't play at MTV, but they played quite a bit during the conventions is Take Me. Um, I think that works really well. Unplugged. It's something that they've done on the cruises also. Um, I think I think that's a that's a standout for me. And Let Me Know is also one that they've done that they did on the on at the conventions, but they didn't do at MTV. And I thought that was that worked really well on acoustic guitars. And um, listen to I was listening to this show from. Minneapolis today, and the crowd is just singing "Let Me Know," like drowning out the band, because the crowd is just—I can't believe they're playing "Let Me Know." I mean, I can, you can imagine being there in '95 with Bruce and Eric in the band still, and they break into "Let Me Know." You just blow your mind, especially at that point. So, those are standouts to me. And obviously, by the time you get to MTV, "I Still Love You" and "Every Time I Look at You" are just as good as as good as it gets. So. There's quite, a, there's quite a bit of good stuff. But you look at MTV, though, that's like the finished product going back from February in Australia all through the convention tour in the U.S. 
they found the best songs that worked and plugged them into that set list. But aside from those that they put in that set list for MTV, like I said, um, let me know and um, let me know and take me. I think are, are great ones that, that really worked on the convention for what they left out of the MTV set, which I think would have been cool if they would have put them in. Mark, what are some of your, you know, real big songs from uh, the Unplugged Era? Um, well, I remember the very first time I watched the actual MTV version of it, the song that immediately struck me as being absolutely phenomenal acoustically, much better than the actual album version is Coming Home. I thought that that was one of the songs that really stood out as one that they probably obviously wrote on acoustic guitar because it just seems to work much better that way than it did electrically for them. Um, I really think that's a standout one and one that they were very wise to keep in their list throughout their whole tour. Um, another one that I thought that was really good was Rock Bottom. I thought that that whole introduction led to being a, you know, a standout song with, you know, Bruce and Paul doing that whole introduction bit together. I mean, that screams acoustic right there. And the song itself is pretty much just like a three chord banging it out on an acoustic guitar kind of song and it worked really well, I thought. Um, surprisingly plastic caster i thought turned out pretty good i mean considering that that to me seemed more like an electric song but it was it actually worked out pretty good i mean i was surprised how good it turned out on the on the acoustic guitar versions of that um it was really uh really a surprise um i think a lot of it though had to do with i think that eric drummed really good on that and really put it held it together with those guys for that song um, and sure no, something I think we can all agree was probably the big surprise of the set, you know, pulling out a you know, Dynasty tune at this point of the career was, besides I Was Made For Loving You, you know, is a surprise at any time, right? So I think that that <clears throat> turned out really, really good. Um, one song, just if, uh, if you would just indulge me for a second, one song that I saw on, their, on your, the list that I was looking through that they played a few times, and one I thought would have been awesome for them to have maybe thought about doing was Magic Touch. I wish they would have yeah. did that more. Yeah, and, and it looked like they, they were like toying with the idea of, you know, sure know something or Magic Touch to see which one would really work. And I guess at that time, sure know something won out that I, I guess yeah. maybe it resonated better. But yeah, yeah. That, that's, a, that's a good eyeball on that one. Yeah, and I mean, and while we're speaking of songs that really turned out good on that set list, you know, that they should have brought in. One that obviously I, I think that they should never have tried to do, and I, I guess humorously they showed us why they didn't do it as God of Thunder, how they turned into a kind of country hick tune. I mean, because, I mean, if you try to make a serious attempt of that on acoustic guitar, I just think it would have been a joke anyways, because, I mean, that's such an electric song. I mean, I can't imagine that being played on acoustic guitar, but... You know, but as far as what was good, I think those four really stood out for me. As far as what were the standout tunes, Alex, what what, what are you going to pick as your standouts? Um, these all have been said, but I so. Um, and you can see a couple of them have really good versions. Uh, they did a really cool acoustic version of "Goodbye" from Paul Stanley's solo yeah. album from '78. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, obviously, knowing the MTV was going to do with rock and roll and like being the, the capstone of the show and so doing a song like goodbye would have thrown it off but um i will be i would say at least with yeah. i kind of wish they did and they did a pretty killer acoustic version of shandy um on the acoustic thing and if they had done shandy um at the mtv unplug um except for the alive 2 studio side you would have had at least one song off of each album of the original makeup era <laughs> Um, with and you know you had a song from the solo albums and then at least one song off each of those studio albums up to that so um, again I think those came out great um, I know it's on the expanded version of the unplug you know like the Kissology I think uh, Come On and Love Me acoustically sounded really great especially on the MTV unplug um, if you got the Kissology version of course you could see that on there and it's a it's a really great version of Come On and Love Me. Yeah, that's the only version I've ever listened to. I mean, going back to 1995 is the emergence of the Internet as well. I mean, that coincides with, um, you know, conventions of all of a sudden you had a resource freely available and to find out what the set lists were. So it's the first tour in, in history where, if you were online back there, you were 
trading. I remember getting all these cassette tapes in from the U.S. It was like nearly every week a new tape would come in. It would be like, oh, my God, what are they doing on this one? And, uh, you know, it was like freshly minted. But what are some of my favorites? I mean, I've sung the praises of the two I'm going to mention before uh, on several shows. And I Still Love You and Every Time I Look at You. Not just the MTV performances, which Paul absolutely blows everything away with. Um, I hey, mean, Julian, you picked a song from Revenge? Long that's favorite what album? I did. <laughs> <laughs> that's what That has always been a favorite of mine. Um, it's just incredible Paul's vocal performance on those two. And you could see it throughout the tour that... He seemed to have a lot of passion whenever he did those. So, you know, when he when he sang on the MTV recording, you know, we're going to do this one again. Why? Because I like the song. Yeah, you kind of understand it. But those two in particular, I'm also going to say Gene and See You Tonight. Mm -hmm. um, I absolutely adore that song. But it, obviously that, you can tell the songs in Kiss that were probably bashed out on acoustic guitars, on tour, you know. You know, see you tonight. I think Gene has said went back way far, and I'm going to be real pedestrian on another pick. A world without heroes is just utter perfection. That it happened to be performed, you know, you know, dozens of times during the tour and make it onto MTV Unplugged, you know, just fantastic. But there are so many songs in the catalog that they didn't experiment with that they still could. Uh, were they ever to, well, they are going to be doing this again. When is it? Uh, Thursday night. They are back at the casino. So that I will say a song. The T. I wish that they would have. They kind of attempted on the tour, and I wish they could have gone all the way through. Um, nowhere to run. Um, it's like a clip of kind of trying it out, and it sounded pretty good. And I know they've been tried it. I think they did a partial on the Kiss Cruise, but a million to one. Because yeah, they and think would have and I guess excellent. Paul at least went back later and did a million to one a Magic Touch on One Life Kiss. Yeah. Um, yeah. So he, he obviously knew he, that he had two go-to songs that he could use later on. Um, obviously, he did them electrically on that tour, but he knew what the response was going to be. You know, they field tested the whole catalog on us, you know, uh, during that tour. So so let's jump into a couple of the, you know, the what-ifs. What of the songs that they performed or attempted do you think they really should have worked on? That could have worked. I mean, Alex, you've just said nowhere to run, and I, I don't think anyone would argue with you that that is probably the only song off Killers that anyone wants to hear live. Um, <laughs> you want to hear down on your knees live? Um, I'd rather not. But you know, Lonnie, if if you do, you know, well, okay, <laughs> Lonnie. Cowbell? So so which which of these songs, I guess, from the from the list of attempts, do you think that they should work on, or should have worked on, or could have worked on? Anyone in particular? <laughs> yeah, Lonnie. All right, I'll go. I would like it. There, they, um, there were some partials out there of I that I thought sounded really cool, and I thought it would have. I thought they could have worked that out a little bit more, especially seeing the response from the hardcore fans when they would do World Without Heroes, or if they would play around with just a boy or something like that. Um, I think I would have worked really well, but. Obviously, they're not going to they're not going to go with two songs off the Elder for an MTV performance or anything like that. But as far as like Thursday night goes, that'd be really cool for them to, to work something like that out. Or you know, when they do the acoustic sets on on a Kiss cruise or something, I'm saying they're not doing an acoustic set this year, but um, that'd be a really cool song for them to try to work through. You know, and I think the audience could really participate. You know, with the snap in them when it gets to the one point, that'd be it'd be a really cool interaction from the band to. To the hardcore fans that would be in attendance at an event like that, um, and then they, they're not going to do this. But I think Hooligan would be really cool to hear that acoustically. I think it would work. <laughs> you guys are laughing at me? It's fine, <laughs> laugh away. I don't really don't care. But I think Hooligan. that would. I think that'd be cool. And they're not going to do it because one, it's Peter Chris's song. They're not. I mean, but why not? You play Shock Me, so I mean, why not? So. I think that'd be I think it'd be cool to try, to to try to attempt that was one that came to mind. 
And two newer songs, too, that I think would be cool, especially um, when they do acoustic sets now. I think um, We Are One from Psycho Circus would be really cool to hear that tried on, a, on an acoustic guitar with the band. And you're already laughing. <laughs> no, I'm just thinking of maybe making Tommy try and do Within. <laughs> Acoustically. <laughs> Thinking of how bad Unholy was. Uh. No, I was gonna say. Um, I was gonna say. Yes, I know from Sonic Boom. I think would. I think has potential to translate onto an acoustic guitar. I would at least like to hear him attempt that. Which maybe because I like that song so much, and I was disappointed that they never even attempted to play that song live. But I think maybe attempting that on an acoustic car, guitar could be something good. You know, because they do these acoustic sets quite a I mean, not quite a bit but they do them scattered about here and there either on a cruise or you know they did an acoustic set like this um last year in california but you look at those set lists especially you know from what they do on the cruise from what you know they're doing now a lot of them have the same staple songs in there you know like a coming home like a christine 16 like a plaster caster which are all great but mix it up a little bit still you have 20 albums worth of material um try working out something different than than what you did 20 years ago on the convention tour i agree so you know there, there, i mean you have and you have four out al- four albums worth of material they've put out since the convention tour psycho circus carnival sonic boom and monster try something off one of those i mean especially the latter the latter two with the current band so that's something I'd like to hear. And that's a really good point that you make about the, the recent acoustic shows. I just pulled up the set list for last year's. Um, that's not exciting. No, and it's they, they had done all of it before. But do you know what now strikes me? That it's incredibly safe. They knew that yeah. coming home, calling Dr. Love, Harlock Woman, Christine 16, hide your heart. Safe. They know it works. Pedestrian. But they also threw in a couple of utter clunkers there, um, in my opinion. The Zeppelin. Well, yeah, that that, that and the the Mississippi Queen. Crown, own stuff. But shout it out loud, and Cold Gin were two which for me did Terrible. not work out acoustically at all. So, it, if put something off Monster or you know throw it out there, try a long way down, or I, I don't I don't know if that would work. Right I here, feel, right now might actually work yeah. acoustically. I feel say yeah could have potential on acoustic. Which one? Say yeah, off Sonic Boom. Yeah, you know, you know, try some of them, if, or, um, if nothing else. Oh, I yeah. think you, I think you mentioned before, Julian, too. Um, I mean, they've been around forty years. They could toy around. I think it'd be cool if they worked up a cool acoustic version of like Reason to Live on the acoustic guitar. Ah, they can, you, like, you, I don't think I don't know if Paul can pull that off now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I think if, if he took it down a bit in in key. That, you know, he could change the character of that song, and ha- I, it depends which part of his voice is working that night. Um, I would love to hear him try it, just because it's one of my favorite songs. Um, I've I've said something good about Revenge today. I've said something good about Crazy Nights. Um, I obviously need to how have many, another. How many views have you had now? <laughs> obviously, not enough. So, so what? Mark, let's get that question over to you. Which were some of these songs that you think really did not work well um, and don't well work well acoustically? Well, I mean, I mentioned God of Thunder didn't work very well. Um, getting back to songs, actually, that I think that would work well. And I wish they would have worked on, like, because we're talking about songs that relate well on acoustic guitar and songs that they probably even wrote on acoustic guitar. So I would, you know, to me, one song that I always wondered why the heck they did never try to play this on acoustic is Rise To It. I mean, the song <laughs> is pretty much written on acoustic guitar. Why not play it? That song would be simple and it would rock the joint playing it, you know, doing that song. I mean, another one, and this probably relates back to the fact that the guy who sings it isn't in the band anymore, but Talk To Me would have been a great song to do on acoustic guitar. That's a pretty simple, straight-ahead song to do, and why not do that? Or Tomorrow, Paul's, Paul's has a really good, uh, that's one of the better tunes off on Mast. Why not do that on acoustic, you know? And the other one that kind of boggled my mind as well was why there was no attempt of Black Diamond to do, like, on a more permanent kind of basis on acoustic. I mean, that that seems like a song that I thought that would have went over pretty decently. I mean, again, there's no Peter there to sing it, but, I mean, Eric Singer sings it better than Peter does anyway, so why not just let him do it? I mean, as far as songs that don't work, 
I mean, I think I think it just always translates back to songs that were made to be played on like loud screaming instruments. Like to me, I love it loud. It just doesn't seem to be to be a, a acoustic guitar song to do. You know, I mean, also. You know, I can't imagine an acoustic guitar version of Detroit Rock City. You know, I mean, how would you do that? I mean, that to me just sounds that that doesn't work on any level acoustically. Yeah. Just that that trying yeah. to play that introduction. I, I've got my acoustic here. You don't do that. It's just one of those things. Pointless. Exactly. I it's, mean, it's futile. Yeah, exactly. That's why I thought that you know when if you're gonna go because I I agree with you guys 100. percent They should definitely take a chance and do some of the. Some other songs, I mean, I agree with Lonnie 105% about We Are One, because, I mean, that song in itself is just basically an acoustic guitar song with just stuff layered on top of it, pretty much, in the studio version, so that would have been a simple song to do. Um, like I said, I'm still going to push Rise to it, I think, is a good one. I mean, another one that I think I would have loved to have heard them try, but uh, it maybe would have been a little bit of a challenge, but I think they could have pulled it off on acoustic, because who wants to be lonely? I mean, that's a great song, why not? Pull it up something like that on acoustic guitar. I mean, you could have easily did that on acoustic, you know. And I mean, Bruce and even Tommy Thayer are confident enough that they could translate those lead guitar bits onto acoustic, no problem. I mean, you know, Bruce Kulick showed that it could be done on stuff like, you know, Do You Love Me and stuff like that, how they translated that into a, a pretty competent acoustic guitar song, you know. I mean, who would have thunk it back then, you know. So I think that there's, a, you know, as far as songs that are not good, I mean, like I said, I love it loud. God of Thunder, making love to me just doesn't seem like one that yeah. could work. You know, Detroit Rock City, those ones that are just obvious, you know, barn burner songs or like a, you know, something that just screams electric. You wouldn't probably want to do on acoustic, but there's a lot of songs in their catalog they could do, you know, on acoustic. I mean, we talked about Mr. Speed. That would have been a great one to do. Million to One, you know, Alex brought that up, right? I mean, even Mainline, I mean, you know, sure, that's not a, again, that's a Peter song tune but even that would have been simple enough to do and probably would have got the crowd screaming for more if they did that because i mean who when did they ever play that song you know not very often at all if any time right so you know there's a lot there that they could do and when you talk about the songs that are surprising that they didn't do more forever yeah I mean, exactly for, especially in 95 why didn't they do that more because it was still Fairly fresh at that time. Yeah. You, you know? know, maybe maybe they were concerned that there were two. I still love you, and every time I look at you, we're working you. out too oh. well. You know that you don't don't want to overload the the sets with too many of the you know the five and a half minute power ballads, especially when you've got to put in shit like "Let's Put the X in Sex," <laughs> um, which I have got to say is my pick for the worst song to be performed acoustically by Kiss. Especially the one rendition with that young child singing it's just it disturbing. was it's disturbing just, on so many yeah. levels. But that whole song is disturbing. Um, <laughs> so many levels. And yeah. my, my my other song for the well, they did try "Burn, Bitch, Burn," which just boggles the mind. Um, but "Heaven's on Fire," you know, got quite yeah. a few um, attempts performances mm -hmm. you know maybe that was one to let the get the the audience sing but dreadful song acoustically I think, I think the only best part about any relation to heaven's on fire on the acoustic tour is when paul does the little intro and then somebody says make bruce do it best part <laughs> <laughs> all right alex what are your least favorites then i guess my life i the god of thunder to me just i don't know the country version the yeah. country one, I it, Yeehaw. it it was it's goofy. I don't, I don't like the MTV version of it. Um, and then I I like the song "Spit." I wasn't too keen with the acoustic version of it. And I will say, I gotta throw if they wanted to have fun and do a, a goofy song just for for like shits and giggles. Yeah, I said it. Uh, Charisma. I thought I heard like one of the partial attempts of it, and I think they could have totally had some fun with Charisma. Um, just as a little fun with with the audience yeah. and stuff, but like uh, like Mark said too, talk to me would have been a great one to do. Um, um, I think the rest of the songs were pretty good that they went through with the acoustic. Um, just looking at the set list here, um, one I kind of wish they would have done on the show too, the MTV Unplugged, and and you can see it now with a lot of the um, the little meet and greets. Um, and Tommy does a killer job with it um, when he do Lover All I Can acoustically. Yeah. 
they do a great job with that. You know, if they were ever to do a Kiss Unplugged 2, I think Love Her All I Can would have to be one of the gotta-haves in that set mm -hmm. because it works. And, it, you know, it, it gets a response. But, you know, let's, let's go to a, a little bit more in-depth maybe into, into the tour. So you get a traveling museum. You get a Q&A session with the band. You get clinics with Bruce and Eric. You get a live performance with the band. Uh, you get a karaoke session with the band because obviously in the later parts of uh, many of the sets they had the girls with microphones walking through the audience, um, you know, handing it over to the crowd. Um, and tribute bands. Could could they pull this off nowadays? And you know, if if so. Do you guys think a format, what format would work now? What would you, if they were going to do a, if they announced a convention for 2016, what would you want to see, Alex? Well, real quick, I got to throw the tour book they had for the convention tour was pretty sweet too. Outstanding. Because it had pictures. I have mine. It's hanging up in my apartment with a bunch of guitar picks around it, signed by Bruce. Um, but a really cool um, keepsake of going to the convention because it had the pictures of the costumes, some of the album covers, and instruments and stuff. So I thought it was a great package. I'd love to see, if Kiss still had the materials to do it, I would love to see another convention tour, because I was, I was like six when the first one went around, so I didn't get to go. Um, but one can only imagine what the cost would be to go. I mean, if they're you know, charging $1,000 for the meet and greet to meet the band kind of a thing, what would they charge to do um, an acoustic show like that with all the stuff up there? Um, I think it would be cool. Um, just because it's, I don't know, <laughs> we're KISS nerds, you know, like, why do people go to museums to look at, you know, various books on display or uh, various artifacts, and us being KISS fans, who wouldn't want to go up and see the instruments up close or the costumes? I think one of the coolest things with the tour they did in 95 was they brought Eric Carl's hot costume. I mean, what an embarrassment when you look at the outfit, you just, you feel bad for Eric, like, wow, they were going to make you do that and you stayed with them? <laughs> what I might have been packing my bag at that point, um, but they pulled that out. I thought that was really cool. Um, I, I can't remember. Did they sell that at Butterfields or not? I don't remember. I don't, I don't remember. remember if that's in that book or not. Yeah, I don't remember. I yeah. Uh, I wish they would have had um, some other stuff. I don't. I tell you, if there's any costume I would have, would love to see in person, though, it's got to be Ace's Dynasty costume. But um, yeah, I think you know it was just cool they had all that stuff. So I would I'd love to see another convention tour again. Um, if they could do a Q&A, but weren't, weren't they selective with the questions even for the Q&A too? I mean, I know you had like that one guy who asked Bruce how much he gets paid and Bruce kind of throws down on him. Um, and then you got the one guy who asked about Benny Vincent, but weren't they pretty Alan selective? Alan Tate. I was just watching that today. <laughs> that is fan That was fantastic. But you know what? A totally fair question. Um, and I think from a fan's perspective, nothing should be, you know, out of bounds. Paul and Gene were both very gracious in how they answered the, you know, the why was Vinny fired question. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they were, they were gracious to a certain point, but also they, they made it very clear that the ethics and, and questionable personality traits were... Uh, you know, very, very obvious. So, you know, I, I don't think they would have a problem with, they should know by now after 40 plus years in, in the business how to fob off a awkward question and go yeah. next without just, necessarily saying next. I just get worried when you, when you see some of this q and A's. I, I mean, the Indiana Expos like Gene and Paul are great. No offense to those who want to get a hug or whatnot. But like the usual, like, why did you guys put the makeup on? Oh, my goodness, go read a damn book. There's enough, you know, answers of why they put the makeup on. Let's ask them. That, yeah, but, you know, it's it's like the, you know, rock line or any of the radio shows over the last <laughs> decade that the, the questions that seem to get through are the stupid ones um, that everyone's asked a hundred times, and perhaps it's safe, and, that, and that's what they demand. So, you know, who, who knows? But it's like the people, you know, they're calling out for songs. And I'm like, rock and roll all night. You know, <laughs> Deuce. And Gene's like, Deuce, are you really wanting me to play Deuce acoustically? <laughs> you know? I mean, I guess, like, I don't know. Like, I'm the guy who, like, I think if I had one question to get asked by the band out of convention, it would be, if you were to have Ace do the Kiss Symphony, what song would you guys have considered doing for the show? You know, I would have asked, like, the nitty-gritty questions. So that's just my take with the convention. Mark. 
what would be your thoughts on if they revamped the convention idea and uh, and brought well, it out again? Well, I'm, I'm just thinking about that for a while now. Um, I mean, right now, you brought up a good point. I mean, back then, when uh, they did it originally, back in 95 or whatever it was, and that, that was, like, definitely uh, a low time for the band. I mean, you know, the fact that they charged $100 and got that many people there at that point was, you know, surprising, I would say, for a lot of people. But, um, you know, now and how they are now, just like Alex brought up, it would probably be easily 10 times that probably to get into one of these kind of things. Now, I mean, as far as what they would show, I mean, like you said, they would probably have to, you know, beg and plead with a few major collectors to get some uh, of the costumes and things back to show on these kind of conventions. But one thing I thought that would be really cool to do, and especially if you're going to be charging big, big bucks at this, because I've always thought about this, and a couple of my friends we and I used to talk about this before too, is that... If, if I was going to get charged a thousand bucks to go to a convention now, you know, you would you would assume a it would be real diehard fans that would go, you know, you wouldn't get so many Joe Common coming to these kind of conventions if, at that price, right? So, but I would say bring some of the old gear back. I mean, if they still had something like you know, like a you know, Kiss Alive two kit, drum kit, or just something like that, or you know, some of the old Marshall stacks that they used for some of the old tours, bring them out make up a roped off section with some security guards and A, either have people to line up to go and maybe stand and pose with Paul's actual, you know, broken mirror guitar and get a picture with that or let somebody go in and maybe play a couple of minutes on one of those drum kits and take a picture of it or video them on it. Like, make it something a little bit more personalized for this convention. You know, they've already done the let, let me look at it, but why not let some of these people, especially if you're going to charge like a thousand bucks, let them go and maybe, you know, hit, you know, Peter Chris's old kit for a little bit for like five minutes. I mean, you have security there, like I said. They're, I'm sure they're not going to let it get out of hand. That's something like that, you know, and, and let them, you know, maybe, you know, get a picture with, you know, Gene's, you know, original base from Alive or something, you know, like let them put it on and take a picture of it, you know, just something different that they haven't done on some of their, you know, convention, things like that before. Yeah, that'd be kind of neat. Put on Gene's Destroyer armor top or a repro <laughs> of it, you know, yeah, and, you and know get, a, I mean? get a picture or where, where uh, you know, Peter Chris's Bandolero from from yeah. uh, Love Gun Air. Or sit behind this kit and take a, get a video. Everyone has a video camera on their phone, you know, Go on there, you know, you know, do a little bit of a drum beat on there, and you know, you can say I played Peter Chris's drum kit, or I played Paul's, you know, Smash Mirror guitar. You know, I have a picture of me with it. It's, you know, and people would just love that. I mean, look at the big hype for like Ace Frehley's guitars. Every time I look on the Twitter and stuff like that, they're bringing out another version of of an Ace Frehley guitar, like that old fifty, I think it was fifty seven or something, like that gold top or something. Yeah, I think that's a fifty nine. Or, yeah. So, I mean, look at the big hype behind that. I mean, could you imagine if you had one of his original ones there and you could go there and, you know, just put it on, like, strap it on for, like, two minutes to get a picture of it? People would love it, you know? I got to throw out there, too. I think a cool thing if they, like, I know Bruce and Eric did the, the guitar and drum clinics, but if they took a couple songs and, and had, like, the demos and, you know, played the demo and, you, could, you know, get something from the vault that's not out there, play the demo talk about how they changed it from the demo to the final product if they used it on an album or whatnot. I think that would be pretty cool. Bruce did that at actually a convention yep. in Toronto mm -hmm. uh, when mm -hmm. I was there. He actually came up on stage and he had a little DAT machine up there mm -hmm. and he had his amp up there and he just twiddled up and he said, just give me a minute to warm up here. And then he's, he went through, like Unholy talked about how he did the solo and he actually played along to the DAT tape with just the backing tracks and showed everybody and it was it was awesome. Yeah, that, that sort of thing's really fun. Lonnie, what do you think? Well, you know, I, I was kind of hoping last year for the 40th anniversary tour, even though we're still on the 40th anniversary tour now, but I was kind of hoping last year when they toured North America that they would have done something like this, kind of commemorating um, the 40th anniversary of the band to try to reconnect with the fans and the hardcore fans a little bit. Um, you know, the Stones toured a few years ago, and they did a tour where they would play a small theater and they would play either a stadium or an arena in that same city. Now, how cool would it be if like Kiss came to Chicago and first night they're there, the first day they're there, they do a convention type show. 
and they can and they charge 500 750 bucks to get in you're you're limited you're, not, you're you know you're you're putting the staple on it. You, you know the hardcore fans are going to go to this and you know they have the memorabilia they have you know an acoustic set they do a meet they maybe they do a meet and greet with maybe not a meet and greet maybe not like a full meet and greet like you would get um at the show where you get your picture taken with them with makeup on and get a couple things signed or whatever but like kind of like what they do at the cruise where they just siphle you through real quick you get two seconds with the band they take your picture bam and you're gone and it wouldn't be them in makeup it'd be them without makeup um no autographs or anything like that you know they'd have security there make sure nobody's asking for autographs this isn't what this is about something like that um and and, and that's what they do even at the cruise or at a at like a like a like I met Paul at um, Indianapolis um, a year ago, and you know I'm, you know I'm going to try to get Paul's autograph, and I go up there, I guess, take a, take a picture with him, and I'm carrying like my uh, my box set guitar case that I signed by Ace and Peter, and then and I get up there and like and the security guys like here, let me hold that for you while you get your picture taken with Paul. See, Paul doesn't have to be the bad guy and say no, obviously, and they can kind of control that a little bit. I think that would be really cool. And then like the next night, then they play the amphitheater they play the arena and you get the full-on kiss show and you get and then obviously you know you get the best for both you know you get the hardcore fans can go to and get their kiss fix at like a convention type thing that's a little more pricey and gives them what they want and then the casual fan that wants to see the bombastic kiss spectacle show gets to see that too and it gives and it, i think it might be easier for the band to travel too they're not you know, on a plane every day to the next city, and they set up shop for a couple days in the city, and then you go to another city for a couple days. I think that something like that would be really, really cool for them to do. And Mark said something about Mark said something really cool that I was going to touch on about you know pick up a guitar or, or something and get your picture taken with it. You know, they could really do something like that. Um, last year, I went on. I live in St. Louis, and I went on a tour of um, the Cardinals Hall of Fame downtown at Bush Stadium. And you go to a certain point, and they have, like, a row of bats lined up. Like, an actual bat owned by Stan Usual that Stan Usual played with, or a Lou Brock bat. Here, stand in, like, this cool batter's box that looks like Bush Stadium, and you're standing at bat with Stan Usual's bat, and they take your picture. I mean, you could stand, like, a, like in front of what looks like a Kiss stage with Paul Stanley's Ibanez guitar strapped on. Exactly. That'd be really, I mean, that, that's something I think that the hardcore fans would, would just eat up. Yeah, and I uh, mean, if, if you take that idea and take it to like a different level, that you could easily reproduce the back line of, say, the 73 tour with yeah. the, the spiderweb background and the, and the stacks, go into the 74 tour and the back line, and then like the 75 where you've got the little yellow velvet thing around the drum and, exactly. and get a picture on those sort of stages. With a flying V in the 75. Yeah, hell, hell you know yeah. I mean? You know, a, a black flying V, you exactly. know, would just be, you know, to get a picture, even though I mean, obviously that guitar is long gone. Right? Hmm? I mean, with the green screen now, they can easily do that. Put you in front of a green screen, get all those backgrounds, you know, made up ahead of time. Right, like a '76 stage, get you in front of a green screen, and then they take a picture of you and they put that in the back. Cause they used to do that over here. They had like a music thing in Toronto, where they celebrated all the whole genre of music in general. And you could take a picture, and they you would pick your background of what you wanted. You stood in front of a green screen, and they put these things behind you, and it looked awesome. It looked like you're on a stage, or you were on a like in like in Massey Hall in Toronto, or if you were like down in like a, in Tennessee in the old Opera House, they would put a background. Like you could do so many things, like you mentioned, like that, right? Yeah, have have some of maybe the historic Kiss stages, but you know that kind of moves on to what I would like to see them do as a convention, and that is Vegas. Yes, it would just That's be like a, would Vegas. be the ultimate for me convention. Number one, do the museum. Get these big collectors who have have spoken about some of the stuff they have in their in their sets. Get them out there, wind them, dine them, you know, so that you can use their gear. Um, going off what they did last year in the Vegas residency, I say a seventy four set, a seventy five set, a club set. Uh, you know, three very easy and not technically challenging sets to build. 
that they rotate out and have the conve- instead of going to all the cities for the conventions, have people come again to you, but you don't know which set you're going to get. You don't know if you're going to get a club show. You don't know if you're going to get a 74 show, be it 70 uh, early or late, whatever, or dress to kill. You know, stick to those, but obviously they that's just in costuming, in backline, in some of the stage props. You know, it's very easy to recreate all of that crap that they had out on the road because it's all gone, basically. Um, you know, have the museum as part, like Def Leppard. When we went to uh, the yeah. Hard Rock last year, Def Leppard was the museum on the ground floor. Well, why not kiss? You know, that stuff's that behind it yeah. was that Def Leppard shit was awesome for me as a Def Leppard fan. And I totally dug it. You know, so why not do similar with Kiss? And then you can do your Q and A's in a little bit more structured manner. Um, you can do your clinics because I would like to see Tommy do a clinic. I, I can't think of if he's done one and I I don't think he has. Eric we know can do it. You know, I'd like to see Tommy. You know, the guy's had two custom guitars. He can do some stuff with his custom stuff and his amps and, you know, run through some of the stuff on Monster and Sonic Boom and, come on, Psycho Circus. You know, <laughs> yeah, you know, <laughs> just be honest about it because it could be it could be fun. Um, I don't think they necessarily have to reinvent the wheel here. And, you know, the, the acoustic sets are cool, but maybe for a convention, you know... Just make it, you know, a blast from the past. Lonnie, thoughts? I think that Vegas idea is like, it's excellent. I mean, I mean, especially if you're going to do like a second residency in Vegas, give make people come back. Give give people a reason to to travel to Vegas again. I mean, if they're going to do Vegas. I mean, obviously, you know, they're not going to do it this year. But if they're going to do Vegas next year or something, well, give me a reason to come back to Vegas and see it see it again. Or are you just going to play? the same type of show that I saw last November in Vegas. Do something different like that. KISS has such a amazing history that, I mean, they have, maybe it's just because I'm the KISS fan that I am, but I think they have just the history of the band, I think is so unique as opposed to other bands, that they should be, at 40 years, they should be embracing this history. And they know the dedication and the knowledge that some of these hardcore fans have that embracing that history and and really showcasing it would, I think fans would just eat it up. Like that residency, that residency idea in Vegas for a convention is excellent idea. Yeah, I mean, give, yeah, give give someone a reason to buy two tickets because mm-hmm. you you're going to two dates. You don't know what sets you're going to get. Right, and, and you're, like you're out there for a Saturday. And a, you a are guaranteed and a two different Kiss era shows. <laughs> Speaking, you know. of, speaking of two different shows, speaking of two different shows, real quick, we went out to Vegas for Friday and Saturday night. And Friday, you know, they played the show Friday. It was great, you know, tears are falling, creatures and I. And then we went Saturday, and it's the same exact set list, song for song, you know, stage rap for stage rap in between songs. And my wife looked at me and she go, and I go, what? And she goes, I'm bored. <laughs> <laughs> it's the same show. But then, you know, do something like that where you, I and, and you know, I was don't get don't give me on a rant about Vegas, but I mean, it was the same set night in night out, especially like Friday and Saturday night. Change it up for one song at least. But but back to conventions, if you did something like that, like if it was like a club show or a seventy four show or a seventy five show, and you switched it up from night to night, people didn't know what they're going to get. You're going to get people to go to multiple shows or people to go out there for you know. A Wednesday show and then a Saturday, a Friday and a Saturday show. Spend multiple time, multiple nights out there and go to multiple dates. Um, I think that's excellent. Yeah, well, I think that that's one of the things that uh, I think that you touched on. That's really important. I think because I mean, if one thing that Kiss fans are notorious for complaining about is the, that set list, you know, and how much it has not changed. I mean, if there's one thing that a, a residency, if they were to do that would have to almost, I would expect to have happen is to do that. I mean, I mean, one thing that Rush right now, who's out on tour, are getting a great props about is the fact that they have an A, B, C, D, E, and F, and even a G set list now, which is totally strange. You know? <laughs> so, I mean, why can't KISS do that? Why can't KISS throw in one song 
that they don't expect for us, you know, and that alone will change the set list. I mean, why not? Why can't they do it? I mean, it's they have the material, they have the know-how, they have the skill to do it. I mean, they're not exactly playing dream theater here, Kiss. I mean, they can learn these songs, other songs, and put them in the set list. I'm sure they can do it. Why not change it? I mean, just changing one or two songs in a set list at these rush shows are making people go nuts, you know? Like, I mean, why not do that? Especially if you're going to go to a convention sort of deal, and you're going to have to do that. I mean, I mean, people are going to get bored, of, like you said, if they're going to have the same set list and the same raps in between everything. I mean... Come on, man. I mean, you got to have more than that. I mean, they're talking about 40 years you guys have been doing this. The only That's that's the only way you know how to put on a show? Like, come on. There's got to be something else to it than that, right? Yeah, well, maybe they just rely on muscle memory now, and then that's why it's always yeah. the same. Well, one, I'm sorry. One thing I just wanted to throw in really quickly about the conventions, though, too, is that one thing I remember a lot about the conventions was I used to love the idea about when I would go to these conventions to go and get these bootleg shows. You know, these concerts, I used to be big in collecting the video, the VHS, you know, concerts of the, you know, Alive One tours and stuff like that. And I mean, I don't know if that sort of thing, I haven't gone to a convention in a long time because they don't do them up here in Canada anymore. I mean, you know, you're talking about the New Jersey and New York and all these Indianapolis conventions. We don't have those here anymore. I mean, do they even do those things now where they show bring bootleg shows? I mean, no. what? No. What do they do no. now? What what would they do now to entice yeah. people to go to them? The only you know? thing I I went to an expo in two thousand eight, so at Bruce, and the only thing like video they had, I think one guy might have had a couple of VHS tapes, and there, there was like a room where you can drink and eat, and they were playing. Ooh, it was the first time I ever saw that Sao Paulo, uh, the Sao Paulo show. They had it playing on a on a TV there. That was it. Yeah. But um. So I used to love collecting those, and I was always wondering, you know, like, what yeah, are you going to do now to boot, replace boot, that? Bootlegs, you know, there was a organizer, we won't name names. Was that in Florida? Um, down Florida? south. I think we'll say down south. Down south. Um, <laughs> who was basically um, raped <laughs> is the only way to put it. Um, and they they really had to... Be very careful about anything that wasn't Spencer's crap being sold. That's what it is when you go. Yeah, like, and yeah. and that's what I saw at some of the expos, and I'm like, why the hell would I want to go where it's all Spencer shit, mm -hmm. which has and diecast cars? You know, the, the the farewell tour shit is still shit to me. It, it doesn't mean a thing. I want to go. I want to go through bins of LPs and 45s, and none of that. Even was, uh, the last expo. Hmm? There wasn't a guy in Indianapolis this year that had vinyl. Really? And I was just like, why? It's just it's not not one guy that had a bin of vinyl to go through. And it was just disappointing. It's just like that's like vinyl's my. You know, I'm a collector, but I mean, vinyl's my big thing to collect. That kill, that, I mean, that totally kills me. I was in a record store today in San Mateo, and all the vinyl was Russian Lilith shit and reissues, <laughs> and there was nothing. And, mm -hmm. and it's just so depressing. I don't want to go to a KISS Expo and have basically rubbish. I, I mean, obviously, that's in the eye of the beholder. But, you know, modern collectibles are mass-produced, and they're not very collectible. They did have these big plush stuffed dolls over there. <laughs> yeah, you know, get your advanced Scooby-Doo DVDs. You know, that doesn't, that doesn't do it for me. You know, so if we're talking about conventions with sales booths as well, you know, I want to see rare shit. I want to, you know, have to get out the credit card and call the wife. <laughs> sort yeah. of. Uh, make a phone call. Yeah, got to make a phone call before you make the purchase. I think when I went to that Kitchener one, there was, the last one I actually went to was a kit one in Kitchener that they had, a uh, Kiss X one. I think that's the one where they had, uh, what's his name? The guy who played on uh, Destroyer, the, the ghost guitar player. Oh, there. Dick, Dick Wagner. Wagner. Dick Wagner, yeah, he was there. And they had, you know, they actually had vinyl there. That's actually where I got one of my vinyl copies of the Paul Stanley solo record from the, the original year one. He had he had a couple copies there, and you know, and that was the last time I've ever seen something like that, you know, or even a, like I said before, even a convention in our area. But you know, it's it's sad to hear though that that kind of stuff is becoming a thing of the past because it used to be one of the things that I used to look forward to, like you know, saying to myself, oh, I don't have any shows from the, like let's say the love gun tour i want to go and see if i can get you know something 
from there. And I, you know, I, I would, I would pick up, you know, the Houston, you know, the summit show there, you know, the second night and I finally got it and run home and watch it. You know, those kind of things were what made it exciting to me. I mean, I'm just curious of like what they they do now to replace that sort of, you know, excitement for yeah. the person, you know, the only other, the only thing I remember to, when I went to in Baltimore and, and no offense, anybody who does the artwork of kiss paintings and stuff, no offense. You guys keep doing it. I'm just not a fan of it, like the airbrush artwork and stuff. So I was I was disappointed with that. I, I'll be real. But like you mentioned earlier, with the uh, costumes and stuff, they had Ace's um, Psycho Circus boots and Fair oh, nice. got to get a picture holding his boot. Um, and they had a uh, they had Eric Carr's jumpsuit from the Unmasked Tour, and so like that was cool to be able to go up to that. But like uh, Lonnie then mentioned, I remember one guy had a copy um, vinyl. He had the Alive for the symphony on vinyl and stuff and that was the only vinyl I saw at the Baltimore um, show unless somebody brought <laughs> their copy of Asylum and Crazy Nice to get signed by Bruce that day Yeah, no, but nobody had vinyl I did pick up the Psycho Circus in your face CD single that was about it so I think we could basically be guaranteed that we're kissed to do another convention and to marry some of the expo sort of elements of a store and that you would be guaranteed that it would all be their mass merchandise um, junk because uh. they, they wouldn't allow competing vendors yeah, in. It would all be – who I, I don't know who their their, uh, their provider is now after signatures, but I, to yeah. me it wouldn't be of interest. Yeah, and that's what it was this really last year in Indianapolis. It was, you know, Kiss Army Warehouse had a long, big table. Kiss Online had, a, you know, like a big table. It was really just official merchandise, you know, and new, new official merchandise. But at least in, in 1995, the official merchandise was a $650 leather jacket with the middle finger on the back, which, while I find it tacky as hell, was at least interesting. Was at and, least. And what was, the, what was the other thing? Kistory. No, well, that was the big thing they were talking about. Yeah, but, so. But here's a question, though, that I got for you. Now, just to keep this on the level here, um, listening to another podcast, which I won't mention the name. Um, Don't say on the level. <laughs> <laughs> but the, 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 person, the person that was discussing this was saying that he had went to a convention recently and that he had picked up um, some really rare stuff. Like, let's say, let's just like, say, like, something from Bill of Coins you know, personal stash of stuff that he had. Now, he went to a convention, and he said that he found and he, he talked to somebody there, and he got the stuff. Now, I'm guessing a lot of this stuff is happening behind the scenes. There's no more of these people that actually have these kind of things at tables to sell at high prices. This is, this, is this something that's just going kind of under the radar a bit with these what, things now, or what's I, going on? I think this? some people had it. I remember, so I hope I'm not cutting you off, Julian. How about um, Bill Baker was at the one that I was at, and I enjoyed him. He's a very cool guy to hang with, to talk with. And he had some, uh, he had some coin papers um, that were like you know aces and stuff, a coin. And he had them, he had them for sale, and so they were like all like in a frame and stuff. And so um, he had them behind his merch table, and, um, and so I guess a few people, you know, if they've got that stuff, you know, they might have it like list. Like I've also got this, by the way. And um, I remember talking to some people. It's almost. Well, like, I'm in the books. Um, obviously, BYU, I'm a little more religious, and so there's some old-school religious books, first edition and stuff, that I've, I've picked up. And when you get talking with people, and they realize where you, the level you're at, like, they can see, hey, he knows what he's talking about. We can we can maybe open up. And so there's a lot of that. Like, you get talking, uh -huh. and they start realizing, hey, he knows his stuff. Then they might go, hey, I, I might have something he might be interested in. The stuff like that, you know, I guess they don't necessarily want, like, some random noob, if you will, to come over there and yeah. go, I like Kiss, I got greatest hits. There will go. always be material that is under the table. That means that it's not out on display until the person has a better idea of who they're talking to. Um, there will also be stuff that is available. And, and I'm not a good person to talk to about expos or conventions. The last one I went to was 2000 Indianapolis, so... I, I don't go to them. I mean, being on the West Coast, there aren't KISS Expos here, and mm -hmm. I just don't have the time to travel to them. So I have no idea what's out and available, what's displayed. How I don't even you know, know how the deals might be made there. 
you know, I get a, a lot of my documents and crap off uh, backstage auctions and an e still on eBay. And very yeah. occasionally someone will approach me directly. So, you know, it's uh, who knows that there was always a thing. If you've got a store, you've always got something that you're not prominently displaying that you're waiting for the, the right sort of discussion to happen. Cool. Yeah, so, I love backstage options. Yeah, yeah it, you know, it, if nothing else, even when you lose it backstage, you at least get to see pictures of some really cool shit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, like I said, like you know, Julie mentioned, if you know your stuff, there's a there's a bookstore I go to in Salt Lake City and downtown and and the owner and stuff. You know, like I've got it now. I was looking for some books and stuff. So I've gotten a couple of emails like, hey, I picked up a copy of this book. Are you interested in it? And so. Same concept, just so it's like connections, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah connections. You, you, Make those connections. Always, always build connections, whether they're at expos or dealers, whether they're in stores. You know, if people find out that you're looking for particular items, you know, you can often build a relationship where they'll hold stuff for you or give you yeah. shoot you an email, give you a call saying, "Hey, I just got some stuff." You know, you know yeah. it, so, it, it sounds really shady, but it's not. It's just like you know, they're oh. looking out for you because they know they'll get a better price out of you than if they put it out at that price for the general public, no one's gonna buy it. So And, and yeah. they know you and they know you appreciate it more too. Yeah, it's gonna to go to somebody who appreciates it than mm -hmm. just some Joe Blow, right? So I, I think that that probably has very little to do with it from most sellers' point of view. They know they're gonna get more money out of you than they would Joe <laughs> Joe Public. So <laughs> conventions. Um I guess let's bring bring it back around and get back to the acoustic side of a convention. We're um, definitely KISS fans. We're more into bitching about the set lists. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a given because it, it's uh, so central to what we've got left, I guess, in the KISS army. Okay, pick a couple of songs that are your you got to do if KISS were ever to do an acoustic convention tour. And I, and, and I say... That the shows that they do, the little acoustic sets they do before concerts, don't count worth a damn. No, you know, they're, you're, they're, you're coming home. You're going to hear the overall. They're, they're so exclusive, um, and in so many cases, we don't even know what those sets are because they just no. do not get the sort of level of reporting. So we're going to keep it strictly on the uh, kind of acoustic convention type deal. Alex, what are some songs that you gotta hear if they were to do it again? Um, I'm mentioned before i'd love to hear nowhere to run um off the killers album i think that would be you know, killer pun intended <laughs> stop it <laughs> um i would love to hear them do like the demo version of y'all that i want um that could like decrease like, i know you don't like it julian <laughs> but um <laughs> julian like next year and say you want to hear something off revenge <laughs> <laughs> you know i think uh i think they could i think it'd be cool to do that um I know, because I, I think it's just a catchy little tune from the club days, and I really enjoyed that little case of clip that circulated until the days he came out. I'd love to see him pull out Life in the Woods, just for, like, shit and giggles. <laughs> Say that again. <laughs> Lonnie. I'd like to hear him do, Mr. Speed is at the top of my list. Um, I'd really like to see him polish that off. They said in the convention for, yeah, we're going to learn that one. And... <laughs> They played it acoustically on Kiss Cruise 2, actually, and Mr. Speed, Andrew, and the boys were all there, and it was like close to the end of the set, and them and their wives are all yelling out, Mr. Speed, Mr. Speed, and so the band obliges and goes into it and plays it, and they go into the second verse, and I'm singing the second verse, and nobody else around me is singing the second verse, and I'm singing, you know, you try to please them, getting on your knees, don't make it. And the lady standing next to me looks at me, and she goes, is that what they say? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, and it sounded so great. I mean, that's that's a song I really wish they would, they would polish off and play um, if they would ever do an acoustic type of tour or, or um, residency or anything like that. I think it just, it, 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 the samples that we have of it, it works really well acoustically. Um, I, I I don't see a reason why not to. I guess Paul always says, "Well, songs are obscure for a reason," but that song shouldn't be obscure in my opinion. That's one of my my favorite yeah. songs ever. So, if that one, and then two of my favorites off of Dress to Kill, um, you mentioned "Love Her All I Can" and anything for my baby. I think 
work acoustically just perfectly awesome. I gotta throw one more real quick. Ain't quite right off Paul Stanley's solo album. I think it would be really cool. Hmm. Interesting. Mark. Well, I actually thought about this and I have an actual ten songs I wrote down. I'll whip through them really quickly that I thought about, which was One Magic Touch, Black yep. Diamond, Mr. Speed, Talk to Me, Tomorrow, A Million to One, Who Wants to Be Lonely, We Are One, Rise to It, and Mainline. Those are the songs that I thought would translate well over to acoustic. And, you know, I thought that they they're it's well within their skill set still to be able to do these songs. They're not exactly upper range, you know, falsetto singing for Paul or anything like that. I mean, why not pull out some of these ones? And some of them, I'm, like you said before, we're talking about songs that they don't, I don't think they've rarely ever done on an acoustic set, so why not pull out something really strange? I mean, I think we've all heard Coming Home enough times, and like you said, Christine 16 a million times already on acoustic. Why not pull out something, you know, that's a bit different, right? So I think those songs would go over really well in an acoustic setting. Well, I guess I got to do mine. Samurai Sun. Why? <laughs> wow. Well, it, it was that or nothing can keep me from you. Uh, uh, <laughs> well, they, they say, Gene said in an interview that, they, that they're going to play a ballad Thursday night that they've never played before. So, Julian, maybe you'll get your wish. Maybe they'll, maybe they'll whip out nothing can keep me from you. Thursday. No, they're gonna, oh, I, my bet would be reason to live. Um, but uh, I, don't, I don't know. Um, I, I would like, actually like them to dig into some of Carnival of Souls acoustically. Um, and not I will be there, which is obviously already acoustically. Right. But I wouldn't mind I wouldn't mind hearing that to be honest. Um, you know, there's some pretty cool stuff on Carnival of Souls that could really be translated well acoustically. That would give it new life, breathe some new air into it. Um, childhood's end. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I, yeah, I think I'd have to go with the Gene song off that. Um, not just because of the vocals. But I, I I just think I just think it would really work better. Um, so that's what I like. Everything you guys had mentioned would be pretty damned exciting to hear. Any five of those songs, okay, any two of those songs um, would do. You know, it'd be it, it'd be awesome. So you know, they did about a hundred songs, I think, on the first convention tour, um, and that was pretty deep. That, yeah. they, that they really dug into it. I would never expect them if they were to do another convention tour to, you know, even go near a hundred because you know they're they're twenty years older now. Um, mm -hmm. But I I think there's certainly a lot more of the catalog, not least some of those songs that you mentioned that they haven't tried before or have very rarely tried that could be done. And and what the hell, you know, even some other psycho circus stuff. Throw it out there, see if it works. Try it. Mm -hmm. If nothing yeah. else, it would end up like those partial asterisk songs from the first tour. At, le at least they gave it a shot, and you know it's like no, didn't work. So yeah, <laughs> I, I think the I think what we get back to is that the convention idea is never a thing for the past. They've continued to do acoustic sets as part of their, you know, their their meet and greets in recent years. It's something that they could do again. So who knows? Maybe Kiss Convention Two make us all go to Vegas. Uh, um, here's my credit card, Gene. <laughs> just take it now. <laughs> just take, just take it. You know, let me take some pictures with your flying V. Throw a Punisher at me. You know, answer I would go for sure. Answer a few questions. So are we done? Thanks. Yeah. Anything else to add about the convention topic? You know, I. I think that, that KISS is so prideful right now um, that going out and doing a stripped-down convention tour from city to city, I don't see them doing that. And I think I think they have so much pride in that, you know, especially since they put back, back on the makeup 20 years ago, that our show is bigger and every every show, is, every tour is bigger than the last one, at least in their in their minds and what they can, what they commercialize. That I th I think that the only way that they would do it is either to do like what Julian said to do like a residency type thing in Vegas to make people go out there to see it and make it an event, or to do it kind of like what I mentioned like do the 
convention one day and then do the all on show the next day, something like that. I don't see him going out and doing t even 10 or 15 cities just doing a stripped down convention type tour like they did 20 years ago because they, they almost had to do that 20 years ago because they didn't have much left. They didn't have many cards left to play at that point because the Revenge Tour not playing, not being successful and barely playing anything at all live in 93, 94 in the United States. So I think that the only way it would, the only way I really see Kiss doing it is either doing it like, like Julian's suggestion or mine. Really. Yeah, and the, the 1995 convention tour, I mean, that was basically a thousand people paying a hundred bucks per ticket. I mean, there were some shows that only had 800. There was obviously New York that had closer to 2,000. But that was basically guaranteed hundred grand grosses for every show. Compared to Revenge Tour, that was a sure thing. So, you know, I, I, I agree with Lonnie that they, they wouldn't have to they wouldn't be able to do it now, go out on the road and do that for 23 days. It's, it's such a different economy as well. I mean, think of the insurance that they'd have to pay, you know, just the, the basics, room rental, insurance, manpower, security, you know, shipping, you know, transport, hotels. No freaking way possible nowadays. Yeah. I think... Um I don't think they've done it for a couple of years, but uh, Chicago used to do like uh, a convention in Vegas. My parents went to one one year. They're the band Chicago. Oh, Chicago the uh, band. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, Ooh. and uh, <laughs> hey, they're pretty cool too, man. I like them. The early stuff. You're in the yeah, them and the Village people are up there on your, on your list. <laughs> hey, <now. laughs> hey, man. They put on a good show. But my parents went to the convention, and they did it in Vegas. And I think it was like a two or three day thing. You got to meet the band. Um, kind of like a kid's cruise. You got to go on one of the shows for one of the nights, and um, and he did like a little bit more of a unique set list compared to the regular shows that they would do. So, like you said with the the Vegas thing, you know, even if they just did like you know had a weekend, had the stuff on display, and then one of the two nights you get to go to an acoustic show and 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 have them sit down and stuff, you know, get the people to come out. I think they could do it. Yeah. All right. Well, I think I think in closing, also I think that the reason why I think they they won't do something like that again is because while you know for us fans it was a great time that we all fondly remember, I think in the back of their minds it's a time that they'd want to forget about. Like you said, they were at a low point at that time, you know, just coming off of a terrible revenge tour, and you know, like you said, they had a thousand people at some of these things, but some of them they didn't have a thousand people, and that memory of you know playing to smaller houses, I'm sure, doesn't ring well with people like Paul and Gene. I mean, they openly said in their books they there was nothing worse to them than going from playing 12,000 seaters to playing, you know, 1,000 or 2,000, right? So I think that in one sense, that memory for them is something they'd rather just leave in the past and move on to something forward, you know? Almost like if they're going to make a convention, why not turn it into kind of like a take the kiss world idea and turn that into like a modern day convention like what that's what that scale like if they're gonna if they want to keep everything on the up and up and make everything look big and grandiose then make the convention that way i mean i think the the one that they had before to them seems like small peanuts you know compared to what they probably would have in mind now if they were to do something like that but you know like you said there's so many logistical things to worry about i doubt that they would you know even bother no, I'm sure there's some cheap land available in Detroit these days. I hear the real estate market's really down there, so maybe empty buildings. Yeah, maybe maybe Kiss World is not so far beyond yeah. the imagination. And at least if it were done in Detroit, it would be in the Motor City, Detroit Rock City. So, Gene, get your guys on it. Find some nice property there, um, you know, and uh, maybe we'll all be flying to Detroit instead of Vegas. Yeah. All right, so that's the convention, the uh, the look back at the 20th anniversary of the KISS convention. So thank you all for joining us, or joining me today. Um, for everyone listening, thank you for joining us. And do come and connect with us on Facebook. We've got the KISS FAQ podcast Facebook page up and running now. And we don't have to accept people there. You can just join and like and listen. Or come over to the FAQ message board and argue. Um, yeah. <laughs> that's what you do there Be because apparently that's the reputation the FAQ board has is that it's all arguing um, actually it's discussing with passion there's a slight difference between the two 
Um, because if you come over and start hitting people with a verbal stick, you'll get your ass booted. But <laughs> we'd still like to hear from you. Come and uh, tell us what you think about the topic, what you think were the great songs that they performed acoustically, what are the ones that you think that they should perform acoustically, and could they do a convention tour? So thank you for your time today, Alex, Lonnie, and thank Mark. Thank you all. And everyone out there, we'll see you next time. Take care. Bye. Thank you for spending time listening to the KISS FAQ podcast today. All sales are final. There are no refunds. If you like, look us up on Facebook or come over to the KISS FAQ message board and discuss the topic we broadcast today. We hope to see you again.